Honorable and distinguished guests, dear participants of the International Public Employment Services Conference 2021 in Malaysia, and I may say also to some of you, dear colleagues, and at minimum to one person, dear friend, and I know that Dr. Mohamed Asman is like always one of the people, not only behind the curtain, but also on stage, who is pushing important events forward in times at the moment, which are not easy ones. And I'm honored as president of the International Social Security Association that I may give you some information about that, what is going on not in your country, because that might be much better known by yourself, but also on the globe around the COVID-19 crisis, about the impacts that that crisis had, and for sure, especially what is the impact on the labor market and what might be the right strategy for the future. And I tried to do that by looking in some way back to that what has happened one and a half year ago and to learn the lessons of that time frame and perhaps to know what might be the right strategy for the next future to handle the situation and to make it better. And for that, let me share some slides with you, which might express a little bit better what is really the situation that we are facing. So at first, I can give you a global view as mentioned. And that means the global view has started regarding our issue as mentioned, not a long time ago. But what we see is that the COVID-19 crisis has happened in different phases. And we all know that we have our personal experiences in that way. For example, I can tell you that in December 2019, I was one of the persons who got the first informations of this new virus, but it was on the news and it was far away. And in February 2020, I was on my last long distance trip, not realizing that it was the last one for a longer time in Southeast Asia and further down than, uh, yeah, nearly close to your country, to Singapore and then down uh, to Samoa and the Fijis. And it was a little bit more than having the virus on the news. It was realizing by leaving the plane that there were some controls, but it was still away. And being at home, suddenly the virus was there at the end of February, beginning of March 2020. And that was suddenly the beginning of phase number one. That has been faced by different countries at that time before, and a lot of other countries that followed afterwards. And that was the emergency response. That means how to deal with that new situation that the virus was everywhere, and that suddenly you need some masks. Suddenly you realize the importance of ICU units in the hospitals. Suddenly you realize how important it was uh, to have some hygiene rules and so on. That was the phase one who was really the typical one for action, sudden action, and really emergency actions there. And no one at that time thought how long that will last. And uh, if you are going to live in that situation for a longer time, but by not thinking about that, we realized that it was not only a health issue, but that it was also impacting 
the economy and on all levels it was impacting the economy not only because the production was not going on in the same way no it was that people could not work companies could not produce things uh, we realized that the supply chains were interrupted or really had broken in that way and that the crisis in total will last longer than expected or feared and that means in the phase two we had to balance multiple objectives it was not anymore only a health issue or it was not only anymore a health insurance issue it was really affecting the whole society and the whole economy and afterwards we are seeing phase three and that is where we are in in some countries that is how can we support the recovery and what are really the long-term impacts of the crisis on again the health level because there are long COVID 19 diseases and on the economy side because what we have seen is that it's not like a storm or a rain to say it may come suddenly but when it's over the sun is going to shine again and we go on in the same way as before no we will see the impact on that crisis for a long long time and what is also important these phases have not been at the same time on the whole globe they have been different from region to region they started sometimes later and ended earlier they came back so the phases have been unpredictable and we were all focused at that time on our own region on our own city and we're not realizing that it, in the neighborhood, in the neighbor country, things might have been different and ahead of us, what could give us some support. So what have been the responses from the social security side? The first thing is that really most of the decision makers and all of the politicians realized within some days that one of the key players in that role to mitigate the health, social, and economic impact was, is, and will be the social security. They are the ones who know the people. They are the ones who know what kind of benefits are existing if you want to increase it. They are the ones who have the connections to the people, and they also know most of the time who don't have sufficient support. So the social security was really the tunnel the tool which was used to bring all the support and the help to the people and on the other side the institutions were really forced to react in a very agile and flexible way we all know that if you're inside of the system that you have your staff thousands of people who are used to work in a clockwork at their specific area and they are doing the contribution bills or looking for rehab cases or whatever. And then suddenly these people need to be focused to pay, for example, some financial supports based on totally new rules and laws. So the whole institution had to react sometimes within 24 hours, not only regarding 20 or 50 people, but hundreds of it. And that happened around the globe. And at the beginning, some people might thought that caused by these regional or national activities, the international cooperation will break or come to a total stop. And I can tell you, it is the total opposite. So what we have seen at ESA was within days and weeks, a huge amount of calls, questions, emails, 
conferences, video conferences, and we all got the same question. What are the experiences of others? What do you know in regard of solutions if we are facing these and that kind of problems? And what we have done in that time is we established the ESA Coronavirus Response Monitor. And within a very, very short time, we collected, or better to say, the members reported more than 1,500 measures. We are now close to 2,000 from around 210 countries or territories, which are related to the coronavirus. And what you can see now is really a unique, a unique platform about all measures taken around the globe, which are focusing on the impacts on that terrible virus. And that monitor has become key also for international and global decision makers. The other international organization, the University of Oxford, the World Bank, whoever, all the ones are using that monitor. And if you want to know what other countries have done, for example, regarding the unemployment system or uh, regarding changes uh, in the accessibility or whatever, you will find it there. It's a very simple structured data. Uh, it's you, you can start searches by five different ways. Look for what countries have done what, look for what topics they have done what. The description of the measures is the third one. You can see the date, that means when they have started or even ended, and uh, where you will find the link with more and detailed information. So if you are going to discuss about the support of the economy, of the uh, reactivation of the economy. Discuss it in your region, discuss it in your country, but take a look also at that monitor, what others have done, and perhaps we will find you will find an idea there because you don't need to reinvent the wheel the second time. So focusing of that what have been the social security measures regarding uh, the pandemic, you see that really on a first ranking place, it was supporting the employment because employment is key for the independency of the people and for the economy. And what we have seen was really a massive, a massive expansion of short term work uh, that means that in more or less every country we have discussed how we can get the people for some time or for some percentage of their whole workload outside of the workplace and being covered by the social security on the other side the employers had a hard time to pay their contributions because if you are not getting an income by selling your products, you are not able to pay the contributions. And it was really in most of the countries that there were special rules that employers could pay their obligations, uh, their contributions later or just for a part. And uh, so to help to get through that phase of the pandemic where no one knew at the beginning how long it will last. The second big field of activity have been really these special measures for the self-employed. Yes, we had an international discussion, not only on the national level, how to better cover the self-employed people. And there were different political positions in that way. In some countries, the self-employed have been from the beginning on part of the social security systems in other countries regarding the philosophies, they always have been out of the system. And in a third group of countries, the self-employed had the chance of being voluntary part of the social security system. In the pandemic times, 
it was realized that if you want to help the self-employed and if you want to offer them some special benefits regarding the employment, the work, the health insurance or some uh, loans in that way, the easiest way is to extend the social coverage. And then it is possible to support these group of people uh, by giving them some special benefits, some cash, and as mentioned also with some contribution flexibility. The third big area was for sure facilitating the public health response. That means to look for special sickness benefits and investment in the health sector that have been stopped in a lot of country for financial reasons in the years before, but now there was not only a strong need, it was absolutely a forced situation where you need the equipment in the hospitals, at the doctors, theaters, and so on. So within a short time, we had such a huge investment in the health sector as we never had on the globe before. And the last thing is also that for sure, the people who are affected directly or indirectly have been supported. That means there have been special benefits, special support for the nurses, for the doctors, for the families, for the low income groups. And as one special activity also very, very fast, there was a decision in a lot of countries to accept COVID-19 as an occupational disease and then offer the special benefits. If you realize that usually the question, if a new disease will be accepted as an occupational disease, that it takes months, years, and now the decisions have been taken within some days, you see really the unusual and very, very fast reactions in the area of social security measures. What is important, even that I'm mentioning always the global reaction, is there are different pillars of crisis responses in the different regions. It was not the global reaction because every country, every region acted regarding the system in the country and in the region and had to adopt the measures uh, to the existing system. And that is why you see different, really, in some way, fundamental changes in the actions. Just to mention it quickly, a brief, in, in Europe, it was really that the sickness and childcare benefits have been increased. And the partial unemployment schemes have been extended dramatically. So if, for example, uh, there have been benefits in the times before only for up to 10 or 12 weeks. Now the partial unemployment system is still in charge in some countries and pays for more than a year. Special, uh, special uh, payments of the unemployment schemes for the people. For example, in Germany, we have extended uh, the benefits up to the end of this year so that you may get benefits from the partial unemployment uh, system for more than one and a half year. And for sure, the service delivery methods have changed. Uh, countries with a high level of bureaucracy and administrations, where you had sent the papers in original form and with, with a stamp and a uh, certified copy and so on, uh, really accepted within some days, uh, even scanned papers or by phone calls or by emails, uh, so that you can really send the financial support very, very quick was, was necessary. That was a kind of service that have been never existing in the time before the pandemic. In Asia and the Pacific, where uh, after the uh, world crisis of the financial system in 2008 and 2009, a lot of uh, unemployment insurances or partial unemployment insurances have been established. 
they have been realized uh, the first, let me call that stress test. And I can tell you all the systems that I know have done it really, really well. And uh, if, if not, the unemployment insurance was established. There were a lot of wage subsidies in this area and emergency loans and benefits to all the people not asking if they were workers or if they were at least entrepreneurs. And for sure, in that area where the digital tools have been all the time much more developed than, for example, in, in Europe or in the Americas, uh, it was really a boost to that process. And more or less, the whole service uh, offers are really switched within some time to the digital level. In the Americas, uh, you, you could really see that they had a lot of emergency cash transfers and one-off payments. And these were focused really on the vulnerable groups. That means on kids, on special poor groups, on special ethnics and so on. And there, where in most of the countries, there was no unemployment system, uh, in some countries, they have established it very, very quickly. What is hard if you have no experience with that? And so the good thing is that they really have the system, but the problematic thing is that there have been no experiences with that, especially also in the administration. And even there, there was a special and quickly set up system for newly covered groups, if that have been gig workers, self-employed and so on. But you see, there was a different kind of reaction and responses there. What we should not forget is that also inside of the social security system, it was a big challenge. It was a, some way a kind of a revolution. So the people inside of the systems, as mentioned, need to be very, very flexible, need to have a different kind of communication and need to work in a different way as before because they have been affected by the virus themselves. And that means they have worked outside of their typical office. Home office teleworking became much more typical than in the times before. And even that needs to be mentioned. It was important to arrange the processes that way that you could avoid fraud and error or even more fraud and error as it is existing or has been in the times before. So it was a total change of the kind. Social Security was working, was not only more work, it was not only different work, it was also a different surrounding where the people in the Social Security institutions had to work. What I love to focus uh, for, for just two minutes is really that one of the vulnerable groups is often forgotten, and these are the persons with disabilities. What we have seen, if you look to the COVID-19 monitor, is that there are some special uh, activities and special regulations for the people with disabilities in different social security systems, but there are not that much. And what we see again is that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the labor market, at first, the persons with disability, disabilities, that means the percentage of unemployed in that special group, in a group that needs the work the most, and at minimum in the same way as every normal, in brackets, uh, people, they are the ones who are suffering the most. And we see now, that the percentage of unemployed in that group is more than double as high as in the other groups. So when we talk about the reactivation of the labor mark, market uh, of the economy, we should not forget these people 
because we need them for our society and we need them also for a sustainable recovery of the labor market. What are the challenges that we see if we look to the longer term economic impact in that way, but still with the focus uh, on the social security? The one thing is the contributory capacity will be for the next time reduced because the economy or big parts of the economy are still hit by the pandemic. And what we will see is that poverty will increase what we see in a lot of areas uh, on the globe here, and that we will get even more difficulties than before the pandemic among the self-employed. And there is a high risk that the so-called informal sector may increase again after years of work where we have tried to cover the people there. So we, we will have a time where there is not the capacity, even for those people who are in the systems, to pay the contributions in the same way as before. So we need to look for some flexible solutions doing that step by step with the contribution payments or give some support in that way if someone starts uh, an enterprise in a new way. What we will see also is with the economic, let me call it uncertainty, that it will have a bigger impact on the small businesses than on the big ones because the small businesses need really to react or to rebuild their network, their connections, and uh, really to look for their market that is smaller than for the big businesses that may also look for the recovering markets in other countries or other parts on the globe. And yes, it looks like that we will see an increase in unemployment. And that means that there are more people in need and which need support and help. The re recovery that is going on, and in some areas of the globe we are seeing it, means not that we are coming to the same way of work that has been existing before the pandemic. So the kind of work is different. We will see more work outside of the typical workplaces, more teleworking, more home offices. And that means the recovery will be in that way more digital. And we will see that the self-employment and the so-called gig workers uh, will get a kind of, of a boost because people uh, might see a risk and employ people and might more offer a job to people to say you can do that on your own risk or just for this project or this moment and it looks like that uh, the self-employed people will get more than before the pandemic and for sure we need to invest in the skills development because the skills for the work will be in some ways mentioned different as before for sure, we will have also financing problems and uh, the problem of sustainability. As one of the biggest problems, I see the political discussions, what we need to do with the sudden and necessary measures that we have taken to support the people via the social security in the future. We all know that there is nothing harder than to cut benefits. But we need to start very, very quickly the discussions, which kind of temporary measures are necessary for the future and which one we need to cut. And one thing should be sure for that. We need to ensure systems coherence for effectiveness and efficiency. 
or to bring it a little bit down to concrete cases. If we have been able to cover self-employed gig workers and other groups into the social security systems, why should we squeeze them out now? On the other side, we have to be clear that no system, for example, for a partial unemployment system, which has paid a high percentage, 80, 90 percent of the income before you are forced to work less, just 50 percent or 30 percent, is able and has the capacity to pay such a high level for the next future because that will end in bankruptcy. So if we look to the future, Let's look to two different things. One is the coverage and the other is really the level of benefits. And we know that there is not only social security on the globe. We will see a competition between the need for the finances for other things. The pandemic has caused big public deficits at the risk of austerity measures. And what has also happened in some countries is that they have reduced the social security reserve funds and used it for emergency measures. So for the near future, we are facing the discussion that all the people inside of the social security system know that is what comes first, what has priority. And we need to convince and uh, to really build on the trust of the politicians that they see that social security can only help in times of crisis if they have a coherent structure and a sufficient fundament for that. So we should not cut into the system itself, but we should think about if all level of benefits uh, need to be that way in the future when the pandemic comes hopefully to an end. So what are the long term lessons at the end for social security reform? The first thing is really, yes, social security, we are on top on the political ranking. We are really on the agenda. All the ones have realized without social security, there is no growth. There is no economic recoverage. So if you want to build a growth in economy and society, you need to do that via social security. There have been second lesson, uh, some coverage opportunities as mentioned with new benefits and with the coverage of vulnerable groups. And again, my position is why should we cut the coverage for those people. If we have been able to do that in a crisis, I think we should be able to cover these people even afterwards. Yes, third thing, we are facing financing challenges uh, because we have increased expenditures and lower contributions by public deficits at the same time. And that will really lead to the need how we can perhaps build faster, better, more efficient structure to use the money for the coverage and the benefits and not for the administrations. We will see, first thing, a digital recovery, as mentioned. We will not work the same time as before. And the last thing, we need resilient, not only as written down here on the slide, rehabilitation systems, but also resilient social security systems because the next pandemic or the next crisis might come. And that leads me to my last slide here. Even that we are all talking about the pandemic and COVID-19, we should not forget that the global challenges that we have been facing regarding social security before COVID-19 are still there and they don't go away. We need to solve them. And in some way, sorry to say that they are even bigger than the problems of the pandemic we are facing. And you know it from the global survey that ISA has done, the top global challenge number one is closing the coverage gap. Let's 
use the experiences from the pandemic to go a step further in that. We have higher public expectations as a challenge. That means that people expect us to do something inside of the social security system. That's a chance, but it's also a challenge if we are not fulfilling that expectations. We will see in the near future big, big challenges in the health and for sure in the long-term care. Long-term care is a tsunami that is coming up in all countries on the globe and we need to prepare our systems and our societies for that and need to look for solutions, how we will look for the very old people who need support at the end of their lifespan. The employment of young workers is the other side, especially in Africa and the Americas where we have huge unemployment rates and that is a risk for society in the future and population aging, digital economy, and the technical transition is something that has got a boost by the pandemic, but is still going on. So these challenges are still there, and uh, we should absolutely not forget this. And by mentioning that, I will really come to the end. So what are the experiences and what are the starting points for the future besides these special topics of social security? One thing is we have seen that international cooperation is one of the keys for solutions in critical times. So we need to strengthen also the international cooperation and exchange. And what we have also seen on a second time, times of crises are also times of changes and of changes which can push it forward, even in a better world. If it is regarding coverage, if it is a better healthcare system, if it is a better support between the society. And that is what we should use as an experience for the recovery of the economy. I'm sure that you will be able in Malaysia to decide and before discuss the right things to do that. But once again, you are not alone on the globe at the end. We can achieve it together or we will fail. But I'm an optimistic and I hope you are the same. And by that, I wish you a successful conference, a successful meeting, a successful future where we hopefully see us not only on screen, but in person. So stay healthy and all the best to you in Malaysia.